I have a word for you tonight, and uh, we are not going to be continuing our worship series tonight. And uh, I also have a word that will not be very lengthy. Um, so that's something else you can maybe look forward to. Maybe you were coming expecting an hour-long message, um, and I can certainly do that, and we'll see. I say it's a short message. We'll see what happens. Uh, but I do not plan to keep you all night tonight, and uh, so. But I do have a message for you tonight, and I believe that it is something that will uh, encourage you. And really, the point of my message tonight, the point of this sermon, is to strengthen your confidence and strengthen your assurance in the saving power of Jesus Christ. Okay, in the saving power of our Savior. Jesus Christ. And as we look ahead to Christmas, Christmas is coming. It's right around the corner. We're already feeling the magic of Christmas, right? We're, we're seeing the lights. We're smelling the, the smells and the sights and the sounds and the carols and everything that comes with Christmas, which is great because if we're going to celebrate uh, something for a whole month, it should be Christmas. It should be the birth of our Savior. And as Christians, what a greater uh, there is no greater way to celebrate Christ than to do it, certainly for the month of December, much less all year round, which we should be doing. But as we look forward to Christmas Day, uh, which is on Sunday, so make sure to be here on Sunday, okay? We are having church here on Sunday. Uh, as we look forward to that, we, we, look, we celebrate Christmas because... Of Christ being born, right? And the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and Him coming to earth as a baby, and uh, God in the flesh, God incarnate. And certainly that's why we celebrate Christmas. But why do we celebrate Him being born? That, that is uh, something that I think we need to think more about. Why, why does it mean anything to us that a baby was born in a manger uh, somewhere? Uh, on the other side of the world. Why is that important to us? And this is something that I think believers should reflect on more. And uh, as we do that tonight, one of the reasons um, I want to do this is, is as we go through the Christmas season, we uh, as believers, uh, our faith will just be elevated and strengthened and will give us confidence and boldness to carry God's word forward. And so tonight... We're going to be looking at God's unstoppable plan for saving his people. And it's a plan that cannot be thwarted by the enemy. And it's a plan that, uh, in fact, God laid out from the beginning of time. For those who call on the name of the Lord, for those who are saved today, I want you to know that God, uh, his plan for you is amazing. And it's a plan that he has designed and set out, and it is unstoppable. And I want to talk about how that plan began, how the plan for the believer begins. And so that's what we're going to be looking at tonight. And I want to read a verse before uh, we continue any further, and it's in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5. This is a very famous verse. Many of you could recite it. But it says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Now, of course, this is God speaking to Jeremiah. Jeremiah is hearing the voice of God. And God is telling Jeremiah that I have called you. I, I have, I've known you before you were born. And I've set you apart to fulfill my will, to be a prophet to the nations. And this word was specific to Jeremiah, but what this word shows us is that God knows us before we are even us. Before we are even here on this earth, God knows us. And God sets us apart, and God appoints us, and God plans for us, and he calls us. This is what we see throughout the Word of God. And so more specifically tonight, what I want you to know is that God foreknew you. God foreknew you. You were not 
a surprise to God. You were not an accident. No matter what the circumstances surrounding your life currently or maybe at the beginning of your life are or were, you were not an accident. You were not a mistake. No matter what decisions were made to bring you into this earth, you were not an accident. God knew you from the beginning, from the foundations of the world. Before the world was even set in motion, God knew you. This is the foreknowledge of God. And, and before we talk about the foreknowledge too much, I want to just quickly highlight another attribute of God, the omniscience of God. God is all-knowing. God is, there is nothing that ever happens in this life that God does not know about. There is no corner too dark. There is no uh, sin too secret uh, that God does not know about. Uh, there, you know, we live in a, in a world that is constantly discovering things, right? You look at our science, you look at uh, our technology, NASA, uh, exploring space. We're trying to get to Mars, right? We're trying to start a new colony on Mars. Uh, we'll see how that goes. I, I'm not volunteering. Um, but all of these breakthroughs are discoveries of things that are already there, right? When you, when you, look, when you go to HubbleTelescope.com and, and you look at these new images, these satellite images that are millions of light years away, which is really far away. It's really amazing that we're able to do that. These images that are coming back to us are pictures of what has already been there for years and years and years and years that God has created, that God has already put in motion, set in motion. God is suspending all things with his mind and God is all-knowing. God knows the beginning from the end and everything in between. And somewhere in there, God knew you and placed you on this earth for a reason. Especially those who are in Christ today. If you are in Christ today, this message is for you. This is an encouraging message for you to know that you are in Christ and it's only because the Lord foreknew you before you were you. 1 John 3, verse 20 says, For whenever our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our heart, and he knows everything. God has always known everything. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10 says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will accomplish all my purpose. God declares the end from the beginning, and he will accomplish all of his purpose. He will accomplish his purpose. He will be victorious. In fact, he already is victorious. Jesus has the victory. All authority he has. All power he has. This is how we can even attain salvation is because God has the power to meet us where we're at. You think of Christ incarnate. You think of Jesus in the flesh. What happens if Jesus doesn't come and, uh, through the Virgin Mary and save his people? What happens? We can't, we can't get to heaven. We can't attain the holiness of God. We can't attain God. We can't attain the righteousness of God. We have to have God come to us. God has to come down to us. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. This is God foreknowing his people. God made a way where there was no way. Psalm 139, verse 4 says, Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. God knows what you're going to say before you say it. He knows what you're going to say before you say it, before you think it. God knows you inside and out, past, present, and future. He knows you in ways that you don't even know yourself. 
He knows your full process of sanctification from beginning to end. He knows where you're going to end up. He knows where you're at right now. And one thing he knows about you, for, for those who call on the name of the Lord, for those who profess Christ, one thing he knows and one thing we need to know is that we are sealed by his spirit. We are sealed in him. It says in Ephesians 4.20, we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. That means that nothing that the enemy can try to do in your physical body, even if he kills you, nothing can separate you from the presence of God for those who call on the name of the Lord. Speaking of God's omniscience still, we see some examples of this on display through the... uh, the public ministry of Jesus in the Gospel of John. I'm going through a, a series in the Gospel of John in Fredericksburg. And uh, as we've been walking through it, uh, it's, it's just incredible to see uh, that Jesus, I mean, he was God in the flesh. There's no doubt about it. And the amazing things that he did, the way that he communicated to people, the way that he revealed to people things that he knew about them that, they, that, that just blew their mind. Because they had never met, they had never spoken a word to each other, yet Jesus, in his omniscience, in his all-knowing character, would reveal things to people. First example is Nathaniel in John chapter 1. We see that before Jesus met him, he already knew him and he already knew the condition of his heart. Right? Jesus calls to Nathaniel and said, you who have no deceit within you, Right? He, he knows the heart of Nathaniel. Nathaniel is so shocked that Jesus knew his name and, and knew about him. One more example we see is the woman at the well. When Jesus meets this woman, one of the first things he mentions about her is in relation to her love life. Right? He, he, he says, I know you've already had five husbands. And the, the man you're with now is, is not even your husband. Right? He, he, he reveals things to her that there is no way he could have known apart from having a relationship with her, apart from uh, loving her. Right? And so when we talk about foreknowledge, when we talk about God foreknowing us, it's on display in these instances because God knows who we are. God knows us because he made us, he designed us. His heart is towards his children. God contains all knowledge and therefore knows the past, present, and future. Therefore, God will never learn anything. Okay? Think about that for a second. There is nothing you can teach God. Okay? I know we try to sometimes. God, I know that you want me to do this, but I don't think you've really thought this through, God. God doesn't need us to counsel him. In fact... We shouldn't do that, okay? Let me just say that. We should not counsel God. God knows all things, and he will never learn anything new because he possesses all knowledge. We learn things, right? We draw closer to God. There's things in God's word that I'm constantly learning, and thankfully, I can continue to learn till the day I die. But that's because I'm a limited, finite being. I am not God. God is God, and therefore God, because he created all things, because he upholds all things, he knows all things. This is a comforting uh, thing for the believer, that we serve a God who knows all things, that we serve a God who's not surprised by uh, our cultural shortcomings. He's not surprised by the war in, in Russia and Ukraine, right? He's not surprised by these things. He's not surprised by our past failures. And we know that God is victorious, and this is confidence for us as believers. This is the omniscience of God. So what is the foreknowledge of God as it relates to us as believers? What is the foreknowledge of God for us? When we say that God foreknows us, what, what, are, we, what, what are we really saying? Well, let's turn to Romans 8. If you have your Bibles tonight, turn to Romans 8. 
If you have your phone, I guess that's okay. I'm just kidding, by the way. If you have your, if you have your phone, that's great. Okay. All right. Romans 8, 28. It says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Now, many of us know this verse by heart. And this is an incredible verse. It's a profound verse for us, for those who are in Christ. If you're not in Christ tonight, if you have yet to put your faith in Jesus Christ, you're missing out, let me just tell you. Because this verse right here is for those who put their faith and trust in Christ. Because when you are adopted into the family of God, you are now a partaker of the blessings that comes along with being a part of his family. Just like I have received blessings from my father and my mother and my parents and my uh, grandparents and great-grandparents. This is how the family of God works. When you are part of God's family, you reap benefits and blessings and promises that God upholds for his people. And we know this. Paul says, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. If you are in Christ tonight, you are called by God. According to his perfect, unstoppable, unthwartable plan and purpose. And this is good news for us as believers. In verse 29 and 30, I'm going to read it. Verse 29 and 30 are the foundation upon which verse 28 is built. We have verse 28 first, but really, you don't get to verse 28, you don't get to the promise and blessings that God has given to his children unless verse 29 and 30 happened before that time, okay? Verse 29 says, For those God foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those who he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. Those who he justified, he also glorified. What you see here in this passage is that before you ever loved Christ... Right? We see in Romans 8.28, for those who love him, before you ever loved Christ, God's heart was fixed upon you. He was planning your path to redemption. Before you ever loved Christ, before you ever knew of Christ, God, his heart was fixed toward you. We see that before you loved God, first you were called by God. Before you were called by God, you were predestined by God. And before you were predestined by God, you were foreknown by God from the beginning. It starts with God foreknowing you. What an awesome thought that the creator of the universe would not just know of me, but would really know me. I mean... Me, you know, think about yourself. Think about your, your highs and certainly your lows, right? God knows us in a way that is so close and, and personal. Before you loved God, you were called by God. Now, all people have the general open call of the gospel to repent and believe in Christ. This is, a, this is an open invitation to all who would believe. We see this in John 7, verse 37 and 38. This is Jesus in Jerusalem on the last day of the feast. Verse 37, John 7. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Right? He doesn't say if some of you are thirsty. I have a little bit of water here. No, he says if anyone thirsts. 
thirst. Anyone, let him come and drink. And then he says in verse 38, Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. If you want to partake of the living water of Jesus Christ, you just have to believe in him. And this is open to whoever Jesus says. This is an open call. When Jesus arrived on this earth and began his public ministry, he was inviting all to believe. And we see in one instance when Jesus, after he had fed the multitudes, remember he had fed the 5,000, this, this amazing miracle that Jesus had performed. After he did that, he disappeared from the crowd. They didn't know where he went and we know where he went from the account in the gospel that he was actually walking across the sea uh, on the water, you know, and gets to the other side and the crowds the next day are looking for Jesus. Where is he? We want to see the next miracle he's going to do. And so they find out that he's on the other side of the sea. And so they go and find Jesus and they like, Jesus, how did you get here? And he, of course, he doesn't answer them, right? He doesn't care to brag about what he accomplished you know he he changes the subject and begins to preach the kingdom of God and then continues to preach the kingdom of God and and says some harsh words some some words that people didn't want to hear about the gospel message of Jesus and we see that they began to disperse and begin to leave and walk away saying this these are hard words and we see that in the Gospel of John, that he looks around and his disciples are there, are the ones standing there remaining after everyone else had walked off. And he looks at them and says, are y'all going to leave me too? Now I'm paraphrasing here, okay? I'm not quoting scripture. Are y'all going to leave me too? And, and they say, Lord, where would we go? You, you are the Savior of the world. And so we see that there are those who hear the open call of God and reject it. Right? How many of you have ever witnessed to somebody and it's just like, I'm good, right? Or, or even hostility, right, towards the gospel message. And this is the natural state of humanity. But because of sin, we all reject the good news of Christ. Because of our sin. The Bible says sin separates us, right? It separates, it divides it creates a chasm between us and our holy God. This is what the Bible shows us. That yes, it's an open invitation to all, but man in his sinful, wicked state will reject that open invitation. Romans 8, 7 says, For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. There are many people in the world today who, who just love their sin too much. They just, they love being in bondage. They love the pleasures that sin gives them, even though it's temporal, even though it causes pain, even though there's consequences for sin. Ultimately, it's, it's pride, the sin of pride, being your own God, not submitting, is what keeps us from following the Lord. Romans 3, 10 through 12 says, Verse 10, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Apart from some kind of divine intervention, like Jesus Christ being sent from heaven, we would be lost in our sin for all eternity. Apart from the cross, we have no hope. There is nothing I can do to attain God in my own human limitation. There is nothing I can do. So because of this, God in His grace and in His power draws us to Himself in order for us to answer 
that call. God draws us by His Spirit to Himself. What does Jesus say in John 6, 44? No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. That's pretty clear. And I want to tell you, this is, to me, this is one of the most comforting, assuring passages because as a Christian, as a follower of Christ, I know that there is nothing that can separate me from the love of God, from the family of God. I love the Lord with all of my heart, and I know many of you, if not most of you, if not all of you in here tonight do. Let this be an encouraging word to you tonight that God has drawn you to himself. You have responded to that call in faith and are now a part of the family of God for all eternity. We see a perfect example of this idea of God drawing us. We, we see this a perfect example in Acts chapter 9. And, and I want to look at this. I know this is not anything new under the sun, this passage of the life of, of Saul turning to Paul. But I want us to look at Acts chapter 9. I want to I wanna go over this tonight. We're looking at the conversion of, of Saul. And we're going to read verse 1. Um, I'll read verse 1 through 9. Okay, but Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. This is a, this guy's not messing around, okay? Uh, just so you know, if you're, just, if you're a new Christian and you're reading the New Testament, you might be thinking, this guy Paul is a, man, what, a, what an awesome man. What an awesome guy. But before Christ... This guy was bad news, you know. Think, think of, just, just picture somebody you know right now that if, if they showed up one Sunday and were just on fire for God, how that would just blow your mind, right? We all know people like that. Think of that guy or that person. That's, that's who Saul was to the early church, right? This guy not only hated God, he persecuted God. People that, that loved God. He, he, he went out of his way. It was his mission. In fact, we're going to read here that he was on the road to, to continue that mission to persecute the church. That's this guy that we're reading about, Saul. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way... Now, the way is speaking of the, the gospel of Christ, the, the Christian faith following Jesus. If, if, if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. He, he was wanting to take these documents that, that gave him permission to bring Christians to prison. Verse 3, now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now, I think it was a little louder than that. And I'm not going to yell in here, okay? But just use your imagination, right? This knocked Saul to the ground, okay? This guy was not a wimp. He was not disabled, right? He, he was a healthy, strong man on a mission. But the light from heaven that he saw, the voice that called out to him, caused him to fall to the ground. Verse 5, and he said, Saul said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who you were traveling with, the men who you were traveling with, 
sorry, the men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. See, this was a specific call for Saul. This was not for the This was not for the whole caravan and whoever responded to it was going to be the one God chose. No, this was specific to Saul. You see that here? They did not not see what Saul saw. They heard, but they did not see. Saul rose from the ground and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus And for three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now, why do you think he didn't eat or drink for three days? Could be he was blind and couldn't find the fridge. Could be his companions just were cruel and wouldn't give him food to eat. But I believe it was because his heart was churning and his mind was racing and his world was being knocked upside down because he had seen Jesus. He had seen Jesus. And if we look down to verse 15, we see that it says, But the Lord said to him, Go, For he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. So this is is the Lord talking to Ananias to, to go to Paul. But God is talking about Paul when he says, he is a chosen instrument of mine. And then he says in verse 16, I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. And certainly we see that throughout Paul's ministry. He became from someone who, who made the church suffer to someone who himself suffered for the church, for Christ. This is the transforming power that only the Holy Spirit can work in our lives. Only the, only the Spirit of God could do something like this. And what this does is, is it shows the power of God. It shows that God is able to do things in people's lives that we could never aspire to do. That God can change the heart in an instant from the most dark, wretched soul to the brightest, most righteous, in God's eyes, light for him. Paul's goal was to destroy the church. The only thing he was seeking from the church and from Christ was where he could persecute those who professed him. That was the only seeking of Jesus he was interested in. Certainly he would have heard the gospel message, right? He knew what they were preaching. He knew they were teaching the way. But because of his sin, because of his rebellion, he rejected the call. It took Jesus on the road to Damascus to literally stop him in his tracks and say, Saul, I have called you. I have appointed you to be my mouthpiece. I have appointed you to suffer for me. Paul went on to become arguably the greatest apostle for the gospel. You could argue that, right? But, I mean, he's right up there. He was a man of unwavering resolve, unwavering faith. Paul's life shows us clearly that God loved him and called him for his purpose. There's no denying that. Paul even testifies himself in Galatians 1.15. Paul says, He who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace... Paul's experience led him to this realization. There was no other explanation that Paul could give for his transformation. Right? It even, it even took the disciples a little while to, to believe this guy, to accept him into the fold. Right? Because of all 
the harm he had done to the first century church. He was ravaging the church. And it took some convincing before they were willing to believe Paul. But the reason they were willing to believe it is because they saw the transformation. They saw that God had transformed him. And just like Paul, God loved us and called us for his purpose. In that way, we are just like Paul, right? Born into sin with no hope. But God draws us to himself and we respond in faith. And it's God's grace, by his grace alone, through our faith in him, that we are saved for all eternity. God called us and he draw, drew us to himself because he foreknew us. Our salvation rests upon one of the great mysteries of God, his, his foreknowledge. This is a, a mystery. And you know what? I'm okay to serve a God who I don't quite have figured out. Because if, if I knew everything about God, what, what would distinguish God from me? I'm glad I serve a God that is high and above what I can comprehend. I'm glad I serve a God who is able to do all things, who is, who is able to transform the heart, who is able to save me. I'm glad I serve a God who, in his mystery, I can still put my faith and trust of him because I know his character and I know his heart towards his children. God foreknew every single believer now, real quickly, some things that foreknowledge does not mean. In studying the foreknowledge of God, I've, I've learned these things, and I think they're really good to emphasize. Many people confuse the word foreknowledge or foreknowing with foreseeing or foresight, right? I can have foresight. Right? I can, you know, you think about uh, a big corporation, right? They, they forecast, they, they hire people that can foresee what potentially could happen down the road, right? There are whole departments, uh, whole uh, sectors of business where they hire these professionals and, and they study risk management and they, they're hired for their expertise in their foresight. And certainly, we can have foresight. But God does not have foresight. God is all-knowing. He never learns anything. He's never discovering. He's never anticipating. He knows. He is. And so foresight is totally different than foreknowledge. God does not look down the tunnel of time to see what's going to happen. Because if he did that, that would contradict his omniscience, right? That would contradict the fact that he already knows everything. If he's having to look down the, the tunnel of time to see something that might happen in the future, that means he doesn't know what's going to happen. That means that someone else is running the show. That means that God is not in control. God is in control. He knows all things. And so when we hear that God foreknew us, it doesn't mean that he looked at us and said, you know what, I think when he's born, I have a feeling he's going to serve me and follow me, so I'm going to adopt him. I don't think that's what it means, because God is all-knowing. He's omniscient. Foreknowledge does not equal foresight. This passage does not say, for what God foresaw, he also predestined. It says, for those God foreknew. He also predestined. To be foreknown by God is to be chosen in Him, to be loved by Him as His own before time began. This word know, when we talk about foreknowing, foreknowledge, this word know in the Bible oftentimes refers to a personal love relationship. 
right? When we think about Adam and Eve to the beginning, Genesis chapter 4 says that Adam knew Eve, and then Eve conceived and bore Cain, right? Adam knew Eve. Eve conceived and bore Abel. Eve conceived and bore Seth, right? This word know in the Bible is talking about a personal love relationship, often between a husband and a wife. It speaks of intimacy. It speaks of closeness. It speaks of relationship. So when God foreknew you, this is, this is God's personal feelings for you. This is the way that God loves you and is uh, for you. His heart was set towards you to bring you into his family. This is what it means to be foreknown by God. That only by God and his grace has he poured his love out to you, foreknowing you and calling you to be justified before him. I say all this because this fact, this fact assures us of who we are in Christ. Our identity rests in who we are in Christ. It doesn't rest on our accomplishments on this earth. It doesn't rest on how successful we are or how much we fail. When we put our faith in Christ and we are a part of his family, our identity now rests in Christ. And he foreknew us. He loves us. This is why we celebrate Christ being born. Because even before that happened, God, God's plan was already in place. God's plan to create you was already in place. God's plan for who you would become was already in place. For your family, for your children. There's no fear of death. There's no fear of hell for those who are in Christ. Because we are sealed by His Spirit. Because God foreknew us and drew us to himself. The only thing we have is confidence and assurance in Christ. This is what we have today. That he, as his word says, has sealed us until that final day. Amen. I just want to say, if you have yet to put your faith in Christ, I don't know everybody here. I know, I know most people here. If you have yet to put your faith in Christ and you feel the Lord drawing you and you want to profess your faith in Christ, let me tell you something. It's the greatest thing you can ever do. Don't wait. Don't put it off. Respond. Respond to the call of God on your heart. Respond to the call of God on your life. Respond to the words of life that Jesus is the only way. There are not many ways to heaven. There's only one way. Jesus says, I am the way. Not a way. Not the fastest way. Not the way with the least amount of traffic. Not the easiest way, right? We know that. He also says the way of salvation is narrow. Narrow is the way. But He is the only way. He is the only truth. And he is the only one who can provide eternal life. And the best news of all is that that gift is free. All you have to do is repent and believe. And then you are adopted into the family of God, foreknown by God from the beginning of time. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your amazing word. And... We thank you that you are a God of love, that, that the word love is only defined because of your existence. We, we, you are love, and you displayed it in such a way that we can't even comprehend, really, 
the way that you sent Jesus to earth to live a, a life as, as, as fully man and fully God and to be that sacrifice for us. The, the, it was the only way that your wrath and our sin could be justified. That, that our sin could be appeased. That, that the, the payment for our sin could be appeased. By the wrath you poured onto your son when he hung there and he took on the sins of humanity. Lord, we thank you for making a way. We thank you for making a way because you first loved us. And Lord, as your people, help, help us to daily reflect on how much you love us. And to, to daily reflect on the, the call that you've put on our lives to go and to be lights in this world. Help us to use this word, to, to use what we've taken in tonight about you foreknowing us and go and be effective Christians, to be lights in our community. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.